Welcome everybody. We're here today with our first Q and A. Um, this kind of got a bigger response than I thought it would. And today I figured I would bring on George, uh, who's a friend of mine and a client and an IFBB pro. And I figured we could go back and forth and kind of answer some of these questions. What's going on, man? How you doing? Good. So far, so good, man. How are you? Cool. Excellent. Welcome on. Thank so, you, man. Um, Extremely hot yeah. over here, man. <laughs> so you're in Peru. So yeah. Everybody knows. Right? Yeah. I'm in South America right now. It's extremely, extremely hot, man. Like, seriously, you cannot even sleep here. It's um, it's it's cold enough to snow here, so I'm jealous. Well, we, you can sleep just fine, man. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So uh, the first question was this was kind of an interesting one. Uh, how does the body use a surplus of calories to actually make muscle fibers bigger? Is it all through protein or do carbs and fat contribute to them becoming larger? So I think this is interesting because I think a lot of people get this wrong. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a direct thing. It's not necessarily that the calories themselves are playing mm -hmm. the, the major role, right? Obviously protein is the structural part. Um, but to give a brief rundown, I posted something about this on Instagram a while ago. So to specifically to build one pound of muscle, you need 220 grams of protein for one That's pound, right. Mm -hmm. right? But the human body only uses about 10% of the protein that we ingest toward muscle. We have a lot 100%. more important things in our body, like our skin and our hair and our organs. Um, ATP is made of protein. So it, it's not going to apply all of that. So in theory, then it takes 2,200 grams of protein for one pound of muscle, right? So when guys will say things like they're gaining four or five pounds of muscle in a week, regardless of what they're using, that's not physically possible. Your body can't really create protein that fast. So, uh, so the process of building muscle does require energy though. It requires 2,500 to 3,500 calories to fuel one pound of muscle, um, as well as hormonal and enzymatic support to increase anabolism. So food will increase things like testosterone, IGF one insulin, um, insulin sensitivity within your muscles, mTOR, um, and the lower your natural catabolism, which is from cortisol. Mm -hmm. Uh, the more efficient your body is using the nutrients to build muscle. Uh, and unfortunately that's a lot, that a lot of that's controlled by genetics. So the more gifted people in bodybuilding tend to be able to use less drugs and less food and grow more right in relationship to their size. It doesn't mean that a 300 pound pro bodybuilder is eating a small sparse amount of food. It just means that they would use less than someone that's not as gifted as them. Assuming someone that is not gifted is even getting to 300 pounds. Right. Um, so there is a calorie thing. The carbohydrates are basically supplying the energy needed for the anabolism to answer this guy's question. The protein is actually making the muscle fibers, right? And the, and the dietary fat is what makes the cell membrane. This is where the fat that we eat becomes really important because if you ate nothing but butter or saturated fat, your cell membranes become hard and rigid, right? And then the signals can't go in and out of them as opposed to fish oil and, you know, flaxseed oil and olive oil and, you know, healthier sources of fat. Um, it's so it's, it's equally the calories as it is the enzymatic reactions and the hormonal reactions of food. And that's why you can typically grow with less food than you think, right? Like if you, like when we're looking at your diet, we're not trying to put fat on you, right? We're trying to, we're trying to have you grow into the upcoming show. So we're just going to play with your calories a little bit, right? We're pushing food, but we're not yeah, you're, I mean, not, you're not like pushing food like extremely high to like a no. Like, you're just a small, in a deficit now. Yeah, exactly. Just a so, small surplus will actually make it grow. Yeah, I usually at the most I, I like to push guys about you know 200 calories in an excess because I don't believe in guys getting fat in the off season. You know, you're the same way. There's yeah. just no reason to lose your shape. Yeah. Well, um, you you also preach it like you're lean all year. Then <laughs> you have to be. I just think right, like what what we look like is what is, is a representation of what you and I do. Yeah. So, that's hundred percent answer that guy's question. So the next one was what ratio of testosterone to DECA would you recommend for someone who is a low aromatizer? He said equipoise and prima ballon crushes E2 and he can't use them. Do you want to So uh, we can't on a, on a, on a side note, based on YouTube policies, we can't really discuss the specifics. Um, and there's variables, right? Yeah. I mean, this is, a pretty, uh, I mean, 
it's going to be different by person by person. I mean, we'll have to look at your history, like how much you have used. Like, I mean, if we're talking about just someone starting or that hasn't even done like a good cycle of just test by itself, I mean, there's sometimes not even reasons to bump into using like a second injectable instead of just keeping the test by itself. I mean, setting up a ratio, I, I don't think it's going to be just as specific as telling you we're going to run 100% of this and 60% of that. And I don't think it's just how it works. It's going to be based on case by case. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I would say, you know, to give them a rough answer, if you're a low aromatizer, right, and you, and you respond well to testosterone, I think the two guidelines here, in addition to what you said, would be, what what is your experience with testosterone like how high have you run it if it's if you're not even run a gram yet i personally don't think it's makes sense to be adding 19 nors in a stack i would say you would i would i would typically if i were in that situation i would run the test higher than the deca right and we'll leave it at that so like you know 600 to 400 or or some ratio in in there in that range but again that depends on their experience and even even as you said as a even just maybe just running tests by itself on a higher dosage, I mean, will be just enough instead yeah. of using the, the EQ. Yeah. I mean, nandrolone itself is not necessarily, I, I'll try to say this without upsetting people. I, a lot of these drugs don't necessarily do anything that testosterone does not, right? Testosterone probably does 90% of the work of all the drugs. The other drugs are just modified versions and they might be very good at one little trait the test doesn't do. Most guys outside of competitive bodybuilders can probably get by with test and test alone for a long period of time, if not forever. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, especially if you're one of kids someday. Um, this guy asked me. So this, you can do yours as well. He asked me what my personal top three over-the-counter supplements are, non-over-the-counter supplements, okay. and what are my favorite exercises. So I guess over-the-counter creatine. Oh. Right. Probably a protein supplement. I'll give you four. A, okay. a, a whey isolate. A high quality multivitamin. So I use Thorn brand. Thorn started as a, a supplement that was used in hospitals for cancer patients. And I use a high quality fish oil as well. Um, not over the counter supplements. Um, testosterone, growth hormone, and no idea. I honestly have no idea. What would you pick? Um, well, like, well, it's going to be, again, for, uh, this is going to be case by case, because if we go over the counter supplements, like for me, it will be, uh, glutamine for my stomach. Like it, it has done the wonders for me. Uh, and that's something I would not, I mean, that's something I'll run all year. A multivitamin. Yeah. yeah. If you have stomach issues, it makes sense. Yeah. A multivitamin. That's also something that I'll run. And uh, what I really, really like is um, like berberine, as an example, like berberine, okay. because I run, I run high food. I mean, you've seen me. I run high food all, all year. And that's something that actually works for me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So totally. those are probably over the counter supplements that I really like, uh, to be honest. But I mean, at the end of the day, if you were just a regular person, I mean, having me to choose something, I will go with just a multivitamin, like uh, maybe probiotics and uh Something else, creatine will work just as fine. Yeah. Figure right. And Pretty then, simple. yeah. And then the one that you said, test GH and maybe uh, based on insulin sensitivity or something like that, yeah. we'll use metformin, totally. insulin, whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's a million, there's a million ways you can answer the third one. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah it, it all depends. But I mean, those two are the just the, the top ones, you know, test and GH. Yeah. And my favorite exercises, I don't know. I mean, I've been squatting for a long time and I'm kind of built to squat. I, I've always enjoyed squatting, even though it's not the best bodybuilding exercise. I like doing pull-ups. Um, is there another exercise I like? Maybe some rows. Yeah, or anything for triceps, perhaps. Yeah, I'm not a great bench presser, so I don't really, I, you know, not something I'm fantastic at. What about you? Um, to be honest, I'm, I don't bench press either. I mean, okay. I really liked it like years ago, just for the fact that I wanted to bench press, you know. A, more weight but other than that i mean yeah is we if we talk about stimulus you know what i'm saying like i don't i don't feel the the bench press I, it has to be like dumbbells 
hundred yeah. percent. So I'll say my favorite exercises will be um, rows, um, hundred percent rows. For the tr for triceps, something I really really like is one arm um, extension, single arm cable okay. extensions. Yeah, and I like to do them like in the form of an X. You know, like if you squeeze down the lat and then go, you know, yep. form an F an, of an X. Like I do feel that exercise. Like, I mean, for me, it's just a, like really really nice stimulus. And then chest. That's something that I really really like to do. And That'll be like that inclined chest, but I mean, not just a little incline. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, me really too. Just one notch yeah. up. Yeah, one notch exactly. That's so perfect. That's I feel like most guys, once they get good at it, they kind of they don't love the real steep. Yeah, that's those are um, top three, I guess. Yeah, those are okay. This next one is kind of interesting. So, I'm I'll give the 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 known science of it. You can give the bodybuilding application of it. Sure. And I, again, I'm not trying to rub anyone in the wrong way. Um, the person asked, what is the benefits of injectable L-carnitin in the during a growth phase? So I've I've probably said this before in other videos, so people can understand. When you look at the human body and the Krebs cycle, how energy is created in how energy is used in the human body, L-carnitin is not the rate limit in fat burning. So the human body is not deficient in L-carnitin, and adding more L-carnitin does not necessarily cause more fat burning what the rate limit is, is something called acetyl coenzyme A. Mm -hmm. And so carnitin will bring the fat to the cell, but acetylcarnitin is, it's basically on the other side of the door that has to let it in. So that is the rate limit, the amount that we can produce of that. The problem is you can't supplement with that. So what supplement companies did years ago was sell L-carnitin because it's basically benign. It's not going to harm anyone. It's not particularly orally available, so it unfortunately has to be injected generally unless you're using very large doses of it. And it, since it's not really causing harm, it's it's no one's complaining about it, but it's not necessarily doing what people think it's doing. But you've seen um, some applications that might be valid. It has some cardiac. It is protective to the heart. Mm -hmm. but that's more like in the hospital. Like if someone is suffering from a heart attack, it can be used like acutely. Yes. I mean, I've seen a lot of people use it, but I mean, if we talk – about you know trying to burn fat fast what i've actually seen and i've seen it really often is people doing carboxytherapy is that how you pronounce it i mean mm -hmm. uh, and what i mean it, it speeds up the i mean the process like i've seen that like, when you diet down like you can see the skin getting like really thinner you know like quick so I don't know if it's, I mean, scientifically proven or not, but at the end of the day, what I have seen is like, man, it, it works fast. Like, I mean, it will bring your skin folds down like quicker. So, okay. I mean, if we talk about that, yes, it works. If we talk about just carnitine by itself, I mean, I haven't seen much just to tell you, uh, make man, it, it does wonders. But I mean, as far as fat, goes and then you know making it disappear quicker that's like one of the things that i've actually seen being applied and it okay. works i mean cool. it just works i mean for what i've seen okay. so it could be an example of one of those things that we just don't fully you know or i don't fully understand perhaps not yeah, something the, i would spend my money on but it, yeah like at the end of the day like there's a lot of things that uh i mean like i've, I've asked you like a, a bunch of things that i I mean, for me, it will make sense. But I mean, at the end of the day, you, you will debunk the myth or whatever, you know, scientifically, like, hey, man, this doesn't work like this and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I mean, you're right. Like m most stuff, and I, I'll say like more than 90% of stuff is like scientifically proven. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's just a little bit of things here and there that you'll be guessing. But I mean, other than that, at the end of the day, I just tell people, man, if it works for you, just just go for it, you know? Yeah, it's not causing any harm. So if you want to use it as far as the growth phase, again, I'm not sure because you're not really, unless you have some sort of odd deficiency in it, I'm not sure what exactly it's doing. Um, it, it would not be, it wouldn't be my first choice of a supplement. If your goal is to stay lean, perhaps control the food, maybe add some cardio. If you're prone to packing on extra fat in the off season, you know, control that. But that's like. And that's extra and that's, pinning too. That's, I mean, the extra pinning, I don't think it's worth it, you know. 
three cc's a day or whatever. They, it's a lot, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's just in a lot of extra pinning for no reason in my mind. Um, th- this could be a good. Okay, so this next one, I how is it possible to increase insulin growth factor one via diet approach, supplement, and vitamins and minerals? So, uh, yes and no. It, it's kind of a double edged sword. So, protein intake increases IGF one. That's mm-hmm. known. So, but assuming that everyone watching this probably takes in an adequate amount of protein, I would assume if mm-hmm. you're a bodybuilder or a fitness enthusiast. So that's already kind of nailed. Um, carbohydrates, a low carb diet will lower IGF one, a high carb diet tends to raise IGF one. IGF is produced in the liver in a state. It's an energy sensor. It's, it's a high energy, um, product produced hormone. And, you know, it needs a few things present in order to be produced estrogen. But again, it doesn't need this crazy high amount of estrogen. I don't know why this is the trend right now that everyone wants to run their estrogen high. It As long as estrogen's in range, it's adequate. Um, and the liver can function properly. It needs glucose, which you get from carbohydrates, mm-hmm. and, um, and generally some amount of protein. You know, and that's... I mean, I think it's just protein itself and a good supplementation. And as long as you have a balanced diet, it should be good to go. I mean, yes. that's, that's what I think. Other than that, it's just a matter of effort and then consistency. That's what I think. And if you're if you're natural, I think this is where the trick is. If you're natural, I don't know who, I don't know the story about who asked this question, but if you're natural and that's your focus, it's not really going to make that much of a difference, right? Because it's really just going to put your IGF, even the top of the range for the physiological level is not necessarily going to do anything, you know, that. Uh, well, I, th- I mean, I mean, yeah, you're hundred percent right on that. I mean, I think just cover the basics, you know, like good sleep, like recovery at some point, like most of us will actually, yeah, but exactly. You know what I'm saying? Like if you, if you, if you cover the basics, you'll be, you'll be good to go because most people will just actually don't even rest. You know, they just train and train and train and train and man, you're not making progress just like that. You know, sometimes you actually need to sleep. You need to recover, you know, you need to maybe get an extra day off. I mean, try to, listen to your body at the end of the day because no one can understand you more than yourself you know sometimes you're stressed out because to to work i mean i don't know having a bad day whatever and sometimes it just doesn't click and at the end of the day if you're not fully recovered i mean your workout is basically for me at least i can tell you it, it's just i mean you won't progress as much you know what i'm saying no, no. it's your health in general matters right like what we're so like we, one of the things that you and I do together is like, we're very focused on making sure that every aspect of your health is appropriate, right? Why you yeah. enter this next stage for your bodybuilding career, because right. if your digestion is messed up, if your sleep is messed up. If your stress is messed up, all of the other things in the world aren't going to make a difference, right? Like we, 100%. Right, we, we were looking at some thyroid stuff initially, some kidney stuff. Like we, once we fix those issues, it's amazing how fast your body can change. Yeah. You know, when you don't have, you know, health issues. Yeah. I mean, you, you basically, I mean, if we, if we, if we're going to talk about, about it, I mean, you basically brought, brought me out of like death, you know what I'm saying? Like I was depressed and whatever, and just making little changes just brought me up to life. And then my, my my body, man, started reacting like quick, like week by week has changed drastically, and it's still that. <laughs> what we, we could do, so you and I were talking about doing a weekly check in. We could do them online, so people could kind of see the process. I think, yeah, right of what goes on, and I think we could put up. You know, we'll we'll find a, like your pictures from before we met and yeah. how fast you. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, I mean, man, and, when uh, get help in order. Yeah, and then a lot of people will say, I mean, it's just a diet modification like every week or every three days or every four. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just yeah. feedback. and Yeah, feedback here, and then everything has to be aligned. You know what I'm saying? So once everything clicks, it's just, you, I mean, yeah. you get to. No, you and get and to the mental part, I think, is huge, too. I don't think a lot of people, Ray Mendo tend to talk about this, but there's a lot of mental aspect of this stuff, right? Yeah. And. I think that's, that's just amazing. If your head is not clear or it's not, you have, you know, if it's not, if stuff's not working right in your brain, it's, it becomes very difficult to grow as a bodybuilder or well, progress in anything. A, that's the first thing you told me. That's the first thing you told me when we met. You were like, man, we need to get you out of there first. And then after the, like the first week, I'm like, dude, you sound completely different. I'm like, man, I feel completely different. Man. Yeah. I mean, you know, you were not necessarily in the best place when I met you, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, once you fix it, I mean, you change really fast. I mean, so I'm, I'm happy because of that, man. I'm happy. 
Very cool to hear. So let's see what the, uh, this is a good one for you. So someone asked what the approaches you've seen success with when working with clients, if they need to bring up a specific body part. So like if you have a guy who is, you know, it, he specifically said lower body. So like if, yeah. if you get a guy or a girl and their they're, they're, they're quads are the hamstrings, what, what is a technique that you've used? All right. So, I mean, and that, that's actually something that I've talked to you about. Um, and uh, I'll be honest with you, man. I had, seriously, I had no legs. I mean, by any means, I don't think I have huge legs or anything like that. But I mean, they completely grew. Well, they're big for I mean, physique. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I mean, I can tell you that I made them grow. And the way I made them grow, made, make them grow, it was actually, for me, this is pretty simple. For me, is keeping a log 100% and just train just enough. I thought, I mean, I really thought you really had to train a lot just to grow. And I was like 68 kilos, which is something around, I don't know, man, in pounds, it's 68 times 2.2. That's 150 pounds. Yep. When I started and I'm 250 right now, you know, and my stage weight <laughs> is like 220. Yeah. So I can tell you the less I train, the better I reacted. I mean, because of the fact that, I mean, when I talk to you, I'm like, actually like you, like we train intense, we rest a lot. a lot. And then we just, we just control our weekly volume. So what I can tell you to bring up, a, I mean, a lagging part is basically see how many sets you can actually recover from how many heart actually sets you can recover from as an example let's say you're gonna do just squats let's say a couple of sets of i don't know uh, hack squats and then two i mean two to four sets of like leg extensions or whatever let's say that's six sets six sets in total you're gonna know when you can hit them again you know what i'm saying or by logging every single week or you're gonna know if you're gonna need just to add more weight to the bar or to the leg extensions yep. or more tension because you will feel recovered and you will see and you'll actually notice the progress but i mean the only way of knowing this is logging everything because yep. if you log your six sets the first thing i'll recommend is not add many sets just leave the sets alone have have them in place somewhere between six to 15 sets the most per week and then go from there if you can keep it the lowest is the better as long as you keep progressing in your logbook, that's going to be the best thing ever. But I mean, what I mean, what I mean by progressing on your logbook, is not just moving the weight. It's actually feeling the weight move with effort, like true failure. And that's going to put you in a spot where you will make the muscle uncomfortable for you to keep progressing every single week. And then, Adding that plus a good nutrition on top of that and a good sleep, I mean, good recovery, you're going to be on the perfect spot for that quad to be able to grow, you know? I mean, that's what I've worked on and that's what I actually, that's what actually works for me. I've done high volume, low volume. I mean, I've done like 20 up to like 30 sets per week on each body part. And I can tell you the best thing that has worked for me, it's actually what science says. And it says like really low volume, high intensity, and then just have your logbook, man. Like have your logbook. That's like the best thing ever for me. At least that's my personal experience. And I can share that with you. As I said, I don't have the biggest legs, whatever, but I had none, none whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, my, my upper body was bigger and I had no legs whatsoever. Yeah. Well, legs, I mean, your experience, I'm guessing is the same as, as most legs take they're uncomfortable to push that hard, right? Yeah. Versus like most guys can muster enough to bicep curl, you know, a heavy, whatever. But, you know, getting under, you know, hundreds of pounds to make your legs grow, it, it's uncomfortable, right? They burn, yeah. they don't feel great. So it, it just, sometimes it's a lack of effort too, right? They're not, you might be able to make your shoulders grow by two and a half ass sets. You're probably not going to get your quads to grow unless you're a freak. Yeah. I really push them. And it's not like you said, it's there is some individual variation here, but it's not necessarily more garbage work. It's it's the right amount of good work, right? Like anything yeah. else, like you don't go to your job 
during the day and just sit at your desk and do nothing for eight hours because exactly. that's the volume that's required by your boss. It's you, you try to accomplish what you're, you set out to do, but right? you want to go to the gym and you want to push yourself. So a lot of times it legs, it's probably just, you know, pushing yourself appropriately. And I don't think it's some endless volume thing, right? Volume itself is not the driver of growth. It's actually mechanical tension. There is a minimum amount of volume required to yeah. grow. You're not doing one set and moving on. We're not Mike right. Menser, but it's, it's not, 57 sets of yeah. leg extension. That's not going to make you grow either. Right. You, you grow from yeah. Tom Platt once said you grow from what you recover from. Exactly. So exactly. if you can recover from more than you, you and I do about the same amount of work. If you can recover from more than that, then God bless you do more. I, I, exactly. I recover from minimal amount of work and I, and I grow just fine doing that. So I don't need to do. More. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm a hundred percent on that. I mean, just do as little as possible with the most effort and just go from it. I mean, and yeah. make sure you rest, you know? I mean, if you're going, yeah. here's the deal. This is, a, this, is a, this is simple, man. I mean, if you're going to do 10 reps with like 200 pounds, if you rest enough, most likely in your second set, you're going to be doing nine reps with the same amount of weight. I mean, if you do less or you do more, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Maybe you're not resting enough yeah. or you didn't give that much effort on your first set. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, for me, it will take something between two to four minutes to recover every yeah. set. That's science of three. So you're right. Yeah. So, so recruit around. the right motor unit that takes about three minutes on, on a working set, a, a warm up set. You can take a minute, whatever, because yeah. it's not hard, but of on course. a working set, you want to rest about three minutes. Um, okay. So the next one, let's see. Okay. This next one, uh, I tried to clarify with the person asking the question. I'm still a little confused. I'll give the best answer I can. They could always ask more detail on Instagram or respond to this video. Uh, they asked if uh, ketophen can aid in keeping insulin growth factor one levels at a super physiological level during the off season when growth hormone and insulin are used or IGF LR3 is used in conjunction with it. Okay. So it's kind of, I spoke to several different scientists about this. Um, and in combination, we're guessing they're talking about something called TNF a mm -hmm. alpha. Um, it basically, I think would work in the opposite way because it, it, ketophen can be used basically to block TNF alpha, which is going to block basically what they call stat three, which is one of the pathways that growth hormone works through. Mm -hmm. So I would honestly think it would decrease the effectiveness of IGF one. If there's something that I'm missing here, it's, I, I wouldn't just, I think if you're already using IGF growth hormone, I'm assuming some level of steroids with all of this um, and insulin, I can't imagine that you need to keep adding more chemicals in here to keep your IGF even higher because there's a certain point that beyond a threshold, it's not going to do any more. So, right. right. I mean, you can only raise your levels so high that they're effective. We could get your testosterone levels to 6,000 nanograms. Does it mean you're going to grow more tissue than you would at 4,000? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So I, unless they know something that I've not seen, uh, no one that I spoke with could come up with anything else beside that. So I would, I would think that uh, ketophen would work in the opposite way. So ketophen is um, similar to uh, Benadryl. It's, I, it's a prescription for asthma. I don't know the scientific thing of this. I mean, that's something you, you will know way more than me, but I will, but I will think is it will just make you way hungrier and more lethargic. I mean, or yeah. that, I mean, that's, that's what I think of it. It seems like taking Benadryl during the day for no reason yeah. is the way I look at it. Um, okay. So someone asked, um, a woman asked, uh, a tiny, d what, uh, uh, wondering if a woman hops on a tiny dose of Anivar, what are the likely effects in terms of muscle mass, fat gain, fat loss, etc. assuming diet and training are on point? Uh, she says she's not realistically considering this for herself, but curious what a minimal intervention would do for a woman. So you you have some experience training women, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, if everything so is on point, man, I mean, it well it depends on the size of the, of the woman. Let's say yeah. we're, we're talking about, yeah. I mean, it, and, and let's say we're talking about someone with a small frame, you know, um, I don't know, under twenty pounds or so, yeah. whatever. Man, just by adding just a little bit, adding one to two pounds of tissue to that frame for a woman, huge. It, it, huge. it's huge. Like it yeah. does make a difference. Like, I mean, 
I don't know how to, to explain this, but this on body composition, I mean, it works just wonders. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what I can tell you about it is that I wouldn't even, I mean, if we talk about that dosage, I mean, on a small frame, it, it just does wonders. Uh, I mean, yeah. there's there's nothing wrong with it as far as I, uh, I've seen. But, uh, I mean, it's just body composition itself. Stop worrying about just, like, the weight or anything. Just look at the mirror for that. Because if everything is on point, it, it will just you will just look insane. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. I think um, when it's fat loss, um, again, if diet is on point and you're in some sort of calorie deficit, there's probably going to be some fat loss. Um, fat gain, I the only in any research I've ever seen, the only anabolic steroid that's ever used commonly that's ever caused any sort of fat gain would be nandrolone. And that was actually in a study compared to, to compared to DECA, but the calories were not counted for. So who knows actually what the people were eating. They were only looking at the drugs. Um, I would say generally gaining body fat from steroids is not a thing it, it, unless your food is out of control. Yeah. Uh, no woman that I've ever met. Your scale weight. So women's scale weight will go up like you were saying, right? Yeah, this is of what course. The, women take Anavar typically because they think it's a weight loss drug. And meanwhile, it's an anabolic steroid to make the weight go up, but that's muscle that's going up, not fat. I mean, if we talk about the compound itself, it was actually created for you not to lose tissue. Yeah, you know exactly. what I'm saying? Yep. So at the end of the day, man, it, it will actually make you grow. You know? So, I mean, even though sometimes if you're in the deficit, you'll, you'll add weight on top of that on the scale. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's kind of going back to what we were saying before. So anabolic steroids... Although not the most efficient way to do it, anabolic steroids allow you to grow in a calorie deficit to some extent, right? Yeah. Because uh, you could just utilize calories more, depending on the drugs. So this, I'll go on a sidetrack for a second because the study that's always cited, that's kind of misinterpreted here with anabora and, and belly fat, mm -hmm. where people always cite this from, it, the name of the study is oral anabolic steroid treatment, but not perinatal androgen treatment, decreases abdominal fat in obese older men. So the gist of the study is they took they had two groups and they started with one group with Anavar daily and one group with testosterone and anthate. The study is flawed because they gave the testosterone and anthate one injection every other week. And they compared the two based on fat loss. Mm -hmm. Well, you and I both know if you took testosterone and anthate one shot every other week, that's not a great way to use it. No. You're not really going to change your body composition versus Anavar daily. When they switched they then switched to use nandrolone versus the anavar. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, they switched the anavar group to anavar raised the liver enzyme. So they switched the anavar group to nandrolone. And then it was nandrolone versus testosterone. And they noticed with the nandrolone that the body fat actually went up in the men. But again, the calories were not equated. They were just letting the men eat. So that's tricky too. Know, again, it's irrelevant. It's but my point is when people will say things like Anavar burns fat better than testosterone, it's because it, of this one study and this testosterone dosing was flawed. If yeah. testosterone taken in a is going is going to have a similar effect on fat losses, you know, as even anyway. better, even even uh, better, so, even better. Exactly. Yeah. At least in, in a minute. Um, if you're in, so if, I was, if, if you're in a deficit, yeah, hundred percent. If you're in a deficit, it's going to work even better. So the next, this next one is is fascinating to me. Again, I know of no data to answer this question. There is very little out there. The person asked if DHB, I'm mm -hmm. assuming they mean dihydroboldenone. Oh, so no. equipoise or boldenone reduces five through the five alpha reductase to something called dihydroboldenone. Uh, but it's a very small percent from boldenone. It's it's actually less androgenic than boldenone itself. So boldenone is one of the few steroids that on its own doesn't become more androgenic as it's metabolized versus certain things like testosterone becomes more as, right? Testosterone then 5 alpha reduces DHT and becomes more androgenic versus, than the parrot hormone. Now, scientists have isolated DHB and they make it as its own steroid. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's sold, you know, through whatever underground labs or whatever. Um, the person asked if DHB at 100 to 300 milligrams has a substantial effect on insulin sensitivity compared with other steroids, even Trembolone, and what could the mechanism of action be here and what makes DHB special? So where I think the, the interesting part of the question is, unless they are privy to some information that I've never seen in a lab, when, 
what I believe they're referring to is not DH, dihydroboldenone. They're referring to dihydroberberine, which affects insulin sensitivity. When If you were to search for this in PubMed, that's generally what you come up with. There is almost no research done on dihydroboldenone. The only thing I could say about insulin sensitivity, and you see it with trembolone, you see it with testosterone, is as, as our body fat goes down from steroids, we become more sensitive to insulin. It's not that the drug itself is causing the insulin sensitivity. It's because it's the recomposition of our body, right? The leaner you get, the more we can push carbohydrates because your body can tolerate them more, right? If you're, you let your body fat go, you just can't eat as much. Yeah, of course. That's all that is. It's not an effect of, there is no special magical effect of DHB. And honestly, DHB, as far as I know, is, is, is toxic to the kidneys. It, the dosing is the dosing that you typically see on the street is not accurate as it won't hold more than 50 milligrams per ml. Mm -hmm. uh, if you see it advertised at that, it is not legitimate unless they use grain alcohol or ethyl oleate. So not something that I would personally screw around with. Um, and I believe it, I've, I've never used it, but I believe it causes a lot of pain as well at the injection site. Um, People so usually mix it with something else. Yeah. I don't know. Not, not something that I would personally screw around with. Yeah. Um, okay. The next question when obese, Okay, so, so the, this guy basically is asking, he's got a very high BMI. Um, he's got a little weight to height ratio, uh, but he's not as obese as his BMI. So you and I technically would both have a higher BMI. Yeah. Like, but do you go to the doctor, they would both think that we're overweight, even though we're not overweight. But, yeah. I'm assuming that his body fat is still elevated higher than a bodybuilder's. Mm -hmm. He's asking if he can, if he's capable of still training intensely then he asked another question about a, a SORM. So I would, I'm just going to say, in theory, there should be no reason, but also you should probably see a physician to get cleared through a physical if you want to exercise intensely. It's, I don't know you. I know nothing about you or your past medical history. So I can't say, sure, go ahead and exercise intensely. In theory, there should be no reason, right? Intense is also subjective. What might mm -hmm. be intense might not be to me or vice versa. 100%. Right? You seem both obviously running intensely for him is a little different than the average person running. So of course I would just, I would get checked by a doctor first. If, if that's a, a, you know, a concern, his second question was running rad 140 cycle. Does he need an anti-estrogen? So as far as I know, rad 140 was originally developed for HR2 negative breast cancer. So breast cancer, that's not estrogen dependent. And it, um, it, it actually blocks, it acts as an antagonist at the estrogen receptor. So no, in theory, it should not be causing any, it should not aromatize or cause estrogen. I wouldn't use an AI with it for no reason. Uh, I also wouldn't run a SARM cycle either. That's what I was going to say. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but that's a, kind of a personal choice. I just don't, I think SARMs, selective estrogen receptor modulators are, are fairly accurate in their mechanism. The problem is, and so are steroidal SARMs like TREN, Nandrolone, those are technically SARMs, but they're steroidal SARMs. They're they're slightly more efficient in their mechanism of action. The non-steroidal ones, like SAR, like these, what we what most people would consider a SARM, like Rad One Forty, basically are the junk that didn't work. That they stopped studying when they became toxic, or they didn't do what they were designed to do, and they basically ended up on the cutting room floor. And then someone came and took the formula and tried to sell it. Yeah, I wouldn't. That's, that's, that's 100%. my opinion. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, I've, I've seen that a lot of a lot of that, um, and there's a lot of usage of that. I mean, as of now, like I see a there's a trend. There's a, a lot of people that use it, and I, I've seen good results with it. But I mean, I wouldn't run it to be honest. Yeah, it just I think there's better things than like testosterone. That, that's uh -huh, 100%, um, 100%. Yeah. percent. And if you're trying to avoid needles, probably not the sport for you. Unfortunately, True. needles are kind of necessary. Um, the next question, which we can both kind of feel this one is test and equipoise for a bulk 16 to 20 weeks dose ratio. So uh, just, I'll give you the science. It, basically equipoise is equipoise is a testosterone derivative, but through its modifications, it binds to the androgen receptor in humans more firmly. It has a higher affinity and efficacy than testosterone. So if you run it, it's some is individual, but if it were run more at a higher level than testosterone and the doses are very high and you've exceeded your androgen receptor capacity, you're going to risk bumping testosterone 
basically out of its place and you will basically just be running on equipoise, which is not good for your sex drive or your brain because it does not aromatize properly. Mm -hmm. uh, I would typically recommend at the most a one-to-one -one ratio test to equipoise. I would typically do it slightly biased toward testosterone. Like, again, this is not medical advice. This is, I don't know this person's experience. He gave his weight. I is, mean, it looks like a relatively large individual. I would say, you know, if you're running a gram of tests, you could run 800 EQ, yeah. right? 800 yeah. tests, 600 EQ. Yeah, Something always about, lean towards the, the test higher, yeah. 100%. And then, I mean, the dosage, the dosage is going to be based on experience. I mean, how long yeah. you run it. I mean, exactly. And then as far as uh, he he set a timeline, right? 16 to 20 weeks yeah. is all he said. I mean, that's going to be based on labs, you know. But yeah. uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it's fine. I don't see why not. Uh, it's just a matter of... It's just a matter of whether you need more, you need less. But at the end of the day, I'll always lean towards, I mean, as far as his question goes, I'll lean towards the test, of course, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And the and cycle duration, at least the way I explain it, is not based on some arbitrary time frame. I mean, the long ester like Echopoise needs to be run for a long time because it takes 77 days or something to reach peak. 58 That'd days, be, I believe, or something like that. Oh, yeah. And so it's, I think the, the kind of the interesting thing, though, is generally a cycle's run until the goal is accomplished. It's not so much of an arbitrary day. You just don't pick 16 weeks. It's either, assuming it's a, a reasonable goal, like if you said to me you want to gain, you know, you're going to gain five kilos, then we'll run that till five kilos is accomplished, not necessarily just stop at 16 because 16 ha occurred. If the yeah. goal is not reasonable, then it doesn't matter. It's not a reasonable goal. Yes. And that's something right. you have. Well, you, yeah. That's something you always have to 12 that needs to stop. I, I agree 100% on that. I mean, and that's something you always say. Like, I mean, if you're, you're good to go, I mean, why not? Why? Why stop? And you know, I mean, you're if you're perfectly fine, I don't see the need of you stopping. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's just the way I see it as well. So let's see what this one is. So we got okay, this is a longer one. I'll read this whole thing. So hi, Kurt. Okay. Thank you for great contributions. I'm 35 years old. Never took PEDs. Um, this I'm assuming is a man. Um, Always got very low E2, so his E2 came back at a 12. Um, he gives the other numbers, you know, uh, they're all FSH and LH are normal, prolactin is within range, DHEA, everything, your sex hormone binding globulin is slightly high, everything is relatively in range. Uh, sides of low estrogen, uh, mild depression, uh, he says perfect skin and hair, I'm not honestly sure how that's related to estrogen per se. Um, good libido again that's probably depends on the estrogen for the person and that's mm -hmm. like low estrogen is going to kind of do the opposite if it's too low um he said he's shredded all year round no matter what he eats so that's not just a function of low estrogen that's a, there's a lot of factors that go into that I mean, it could um, be nutrition it could be genetics it yeah could be i mean ethic. honestly not to go off on a tangent but they just did a there was a gigantic meta-analysis done on overweight and lean people to see what the differences were. And they came to the conclusion that there was actually no hormonal difference between the two. It generally was appetite control. The people that tend to be leaner tend to get full faster and tend to know when to stop eating versus people have dysregulated eating and they tend to overeat. It was not like a thyroid issue or, mm -hmm. you know, a leptin or Graveland thing. It was just, unfortunately, it was just the way we deal with appetite. Um, so the rest of the question is, if one day I jump on testosterone, would it be harder for me with my genetically low estrogen blood baseline to get my endogenous production back using a serum on PCT? So he means using tamoxifen on post cycle therapy. He doesn't want to jump on TRT for life. Now his, the last part of his question as clomiphene or tamoxifen uprating, this is his words, not mine, <laughs> upregulating through the estrogen receptor. I feel they might be a little of efficacy on me. Um, and then he thanked me for answering. Um, I would say, I would say just not, don't jump on it. Don't, yeah. don't use it. I mean, if you're fine, just like that, you're lean. I mean, you're healthy. I mean, you feel great and you don't want to be on TRT for the rest of your life. I, I would say just, just don't do it. I mean, yeah. you're perfectly fine. I would say you could use 
HCG would be more effective. Like if you wanted to do something just to get the, you know, testosterone, you want to get the, that aromatizes as well. They could produce some more estrogen. I'm with you though. I, you know, if, if things are off, as far as PCT is concerned, there's no actual data to support the use of PCT. The end outcome is the same as far as recovery. Mentally, people feel better when they're actively doing something to aid in their recovery. So they feel like they're going to improve better. But there's no real data to show that using tamoxifen after you come off a steroid cycle is doing much. The outcome is the same. You will recover what you're going to recover. And that depends on genetic factors, the duration of your steroid cycle, the dose of your steroid cycle, and numerous other things that are going on inside of your body right? Your mm -hmm. weight. Um, so it, that's almost impossible to say. I would say very rarely do people recover to hundred percent. You probably recover the first time 80 or 90% and then it continues to go down. I would think it's healthier to be on TRT than it probably is to go on and off steroid cycles. Yeah. A hundred percent. Like what I've seen the most is like, even when people have even abused of it, uh, they still come off, you know, to be fertile again mm -hmm. and they've done it. And I've seen the cases yeah. within a month get, up to like a year. year. Yeah. But I mean, you go back to it because at the end of the day, I mean, the way how you feel at the end of the day, you're going to go most people. I mean, I, I haven't seen at least I have not seen a case where they don't go back to TRT. Yeah, I know. At That's, least not, not I, yet. I mean, no, I, I have not seen one. one when, when people ask me if they were to start TRT, what do they do if they want to stop? And I generally say, well, why don't you start CRT? Because I've never met anyone in person that actually wanted to stop. doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But that's, I mean, everybody's different. And so just to address what he said about clomiphene and tamoxifen upregulating through estrogen receptors. So that's not 100% the case. So a serum typically like tamoxifen, mm -hmm. clomiphen is, is a weird serum. I wouldn't really use it because of the visual disturbances. It's not, would not be my drug of choice for men. Uh, tamoxifen though, it, it basically, it's going to block the estrogen alpha receptor, which is the typically considered the bad one where cancer mm -hmm. tends to be like in the breasts. And it tends to upregulate as an agonist of the estrogen beta receptor, which is typically found in things like the liver. And in women, it's found in the vagina and other areas that they need estrogen, but not places you want to block estrogen. So that's kind of what makes a serum a serum is it interacts differently with different estrogen receptors. It's not necessarily upregulating any receptor. It's not causing more proliferation or more receptors. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. What is the cause of visceral fat and how to reduce and manage the overall bodybuilding bloat and correlation with elevated food levels? I think they're kind of two separate things. Yeah. Uh, Technically, visceral fat accumulation at a large degree is considered an endocrine disorder. It's it's basically comes down to insulin sensitivity, too much food, and probably the wrong types of food. I mean, it's debatable, but generally, in all the research, it's processed junk. It's high refined sugar. It's high saturated fat, trans fat, uh, baked goods, cookies, ice cream, cake, the standard American diet, right? Bacon. I'm going to make people angry saying this stuff. It's the stuff that you know you shouldn't be eating that's causing that. And then that stuff in excess, right? Like if yeah. you can eat this stuff in moderation, then so be it. But when guys, when their belly's actually distended, it's they've, they've eaten too much. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of them, that's food. what it is. I mean, yeah, it's, it's basically it comes down to, you know, generally an insulin sensitivity issue. Well, uh, I mean, that's fat is associated with diabetes. So you don't really want to, you want to minimize that. Yep. 100%. What do you want? So, you can do this part if you want. What about reducing and managing overall bodybuilding bloat in correlation with elevated food levels? Well, that's going to depend. What, what, I mean, you have to understand that something is causing the bloat, the bloating, you know. Sometimes, uh, I mean, you got to mix up some carbs because, like, I've seen some people, as an example, they do great with oats, but I, let's say you give them, like, 70 grams of oats and then they go up to like 80 and then those 80 grams of oats it destroys them so you have to pull back and then maybe add i don't know man maybe some bread maybe some that's why you want to mix it up you, you i mean you have to really pay attention to sometimes like i get a lot of people no man like really like rice is perfect for me like sweet potatoes are perfect for me but up to what amount up to a point yeah there's a point you know I can do so, one sweet potato, sweet potato a day at like 85 grams. And then after that, it's it's not good, right? Same with rice. Like 
it gets gross after a certain point. Same with oatmeal. They all, yeah. And, and like we said in the beginning, your digestion is huge for bodybuilding. So going back actually to OTC supplements, one thing that I really like is actually uh, digestive enzymes. Like okay. I do them yeah. with every single meal, to be honest. Yeah. I, I've done that for like the past, I don't know, man, a couple of years or so that I have not missed uh, digestive enzyme. And I can tell you, there was a point in my life that I couldn't even eat a vegetable for the fact that I would not digest it and I'll get bloated. And ever since I started like glutamine, digestive enzymes and stuff, I never get bloated again. Like I just don't at all, not even how much I eat. And then you've seen my food. I mean, you, you give me like my refits are like high and then, uh, <laughs> and I don't even get bloated. So, I some unfortunately you I keep it, food every day. Yeah. So, I mean if you keep it consistency, I mean if you keep it cons- if you do it if you do it like every single day, you keep your digestive enzymes on at least something that I do, digestive enzymes on every single meal, and then uh my glutamine, that actually does wonders. But then going back to the question itself, manage your food, pay attention to what you're eating. Uh I mean, have a book with you, take notes, and go from there. Once you start building up your notes, sometimes it's just not a matter of, man, up to certain points, certain foods, and then rotate them. I mean, the more variety that you have off season is going to be the better for you. That's what I think. So that plus digestive enzymes and then having at least some form of cardio will actually help you digest better, man. That's what I've seen. Even walking. Exactly, walking. Yeah, just just get moving. I mean, run. Yeah, you don't have anything. to run. I mean, you know, I mean, you can do hit cardio, you can do least cardio, you can do walking, you can do whatever. I mean, as long as it helps you digest. And I something that I've actually found that it works like perfect is just walking after every single meal, man. If you walk after every single meal, if you can, if it's possible, go ahead and do okay. it. That's gonna do wonders for you, and that's gonna reduce bloating. Yeah. And something people can do if they struggle getting cardio in, just what you said, it, if it's low intensity cardio, it doesn't matter if you split it up or not. High intensity yeah. cardio is a little different because your heart rate needs to be up or if you're training for a race that you need to be, you know, have endurance or something for. But if you if you need to do an hour of cardio a day, if, if, you, if you walk for 10 minutes six times a day, it's the same thing. The cumulative effect, the calories are still burned the same way. So it doesn't matter. And like you said, it'll help improve digestion. Yeah. It's easier to fit in your day generally if you can just split it up a little bit. Versus yeah. like commit an hour. Um, another question that we got that I'm not going to go into too much depth. We could, I probably do a whole video on this one. It's just someone asked based on a post that I was tagged in today on estrogen and the immune system. And they asked what the link was. Um, estrogen directly affects T cell production and T cell function. So it, it, it does have a direct real link on things like autoimmune disease and inflammation. Um, I can, I feel like that's a whole estrogen and the immune system is probably a whole separate video, but it is directly linked to that. And a lot of that is, is new research. Um, okay. So two more, we can both feel this one cause we might have different opinions, which has greater potential of lean mass, lean muscle growth, Masteron or Primo with TRT dosing of test and decent amount of GH. If the person has already a high level of estrogen, a hundred plus in the body, just curious. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the estrogen thing real fast. So why any man is running his estrogen over a hundred, I don't know. This should not be done on purpose. There's a reason. Now all ranges on blood work are not necessarily modern or accurate. TSH is a great example where the range is not necessarily a great thing in a man. Uh, Estrogen levels at a hundred for a man is not ever appropriate. It has no correlation there with use of IGF. It is not going to make you grow more muscle. We are not cattle. It should not be that high ever. So I would worry about reducing. We also wonder why your estrogen is so high if you're on TRT. Because that there must be either a polymorphism in that CYP gene or you have a higher level of body fat. But going back to the question, Masteron versus Primo. So we'll be real straightforward with this. from my research, Masteron is considered an anti-proliferic agent. It was invented in 1959 by Syntex. The hope was it was an anti-tumor agent. 
And when they originally tested it on rats, it caused no muscle growth. So they continued to pursue the relationship with it in cancer. Anadrol, which is invented at the same time, did not work the same way, caused muscle growth, and they didn't use it for cancer. Masteron has no known anabolic rating. It has no known binding affinity to the AR, to the ER, to the progesterone receptor, to cortisol, to mineral uh, cortisoid. It, we only know the binding to the sex hormone binding globulin. That is the only thing known. The assays done on it were not completed because it didn't show efficacious to build tissue. That being said, does it mean it doesn't grow tissue? No, just no one can answer that question. I don't know anyone who's ever used Mastron alone and gotten large. Not that I would ever, I would not recommend that because you'd have no estrogen because it doesn't aromatize, but I would not be a first call anabolic. I know for some reason recently it's become this trendy thing and guys are running it in massive gram quantities in the off season along with test. Not what I would choose. I would take Primo any day over it if I wanted to grow. Primobolin is technically an anabolic steroid, so it would be the opposite of Mastron. As far as med if you look at the medical use of these drugs, Primobolin was used in cases of anemia and muscle wasting, and those are both cases of anabolism where you want tissue growth or cell growth. Mastron was used in cases where you want no cell growth. We were trying to stop growth of cancer or breast tissue. So they're totally designed differently. So even though that they're in theory, they're related because they're both DHT structurally. They're not related at all. Uh, Proviron is actually much closer related to primobolin, even though, again, those two are not related either. Um, I would say primo if your goal is to grow. I would say Mastron is great if you're pre-contest as a hardening agent, eight weeks, like it was used traditionally for the last 30 years, right? I don't know. That's the way I would deploy it. I, it's not something I would use in the off-season. Um, I think... I mean, for me, it's fine. Like I've seen a lot of people running master on off season. I've seen it works, but, um, at the end of the day, what I've seen is that most people will choose master on over Primo because of the fact that Primo is harder to find. Um, so to get a real Primo, I mean, it's hard to find, and the dosages that most people use are high, and it's expensive as well. So most people will actually buy the Mastron because if it's, you know, more real, and then it's also cheaper. So that's the reason I'll see more people using Mastron over Primo. But yeah. other than that, if you tell me what to choose, I'll definitely choose Primo over Mastron if we were to run it in the off season. But I mean, I don't see. Um, I mean, if it's a pre if it's a matter of preference, definitely primo. But I don't see why not. I mean, for me at least, for experience, I don't see why not running more. Uh, running master will actually defer. I've done both, but I've seen. I, I do think that primo works better. To be honest, I would think masteron seems to be. So masteron also acts as a serum. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's blocking estrogen receptor alpha. It's not actually lowering serum estradiol. It's just blocking it at the receptor. The reason why it appears drier is because when you block ERA, you also um, you mess with the water balance in the body. So you're, you're getting that kind of effect. Where primobolin, it through its metabolites can act as an AI. That also depends on the person and their genetics. How strong that effect is. There are some people who take 100 milligrams of primo and it crashes their, their estrogen. There's other people that can take a gram of it and they have no issue. So. Again, I would manage estrogen on its own, and I would probably put Primo, assuming you know it's real. Yeah. Well, if, if you if you tell me to choose, I'll choose test over everything. <laughs> exactly. Well, I would say, or you can choose better on a blog, right? That you have Equipoise, Mandrolone, Tremolone. Yeah. There's, I think, there's other things. You know, nowadays everyone wants to to play this. I get the safety thing, and I I would probably advocate for safety over anything. But I think the, the thought process seems really flawed now when guys want to preach that they're safe and you're running two grams of Mastron. Mastron's yeah, no. never been tested yeah, on men. I, I mean, never safe about running two grams of anything. Yeah. No, so, it, it's just, no safe. That's there's tough. no safe. It's just a, a you know a better approach or whatever you yeah. want to call it. Yeah, I yeah, it just seems silly. But okay, the last question: What is the optimal amount of growth hormone for muscle growth? That's a really good question, man. So, I mean, pretty much five IUs or more is really where it starts. There's all, not a whole lot of muscle growth below that unless you're really deficient, I would say. And then it's – I hate I hate to say this because it's the opposite of being safe. It honestly comes down to what you can afford and what you can tolerate. It's kind of the sky's the limit. How much muscle do you want from it? 
the pros are now running between a bottle and three bottles a day, depending the guys in open are probably closer to three bottles. I know some, I'm probably going to get nasty comments on this. I know pros that are running three bottles a day. I know plenty of people pro and amateur that are running a bottle a day. Yeah. Um, I'd say five to 10 for the average person. If it's a budgetary concern, I would run five to 10 it would be a, a sane amount. The more, yeah, I mean, the more the I cannot tell you much about experience about uh, high dosages of GH, but uh, that's what I've seen. I mean, and also what I've seen is the side effects, you know, the thyroid will actually uh, downregulate. Um, you'll also see uh, insulin sensitivity, get it a little bit yeah, yeah. up. So you have to run some insulin with some, I mean, most of the times. I mean, within time, I'm not saying it's going to happen eventually, but I mean, it, it, it's case by case dependent, you know. But yes, what I've seen is that uh, most usage between two to three AUs, uh, I see it just a, a replacement. I mean, even though, yeah, I mean it works. I'm not gonna don't, don't get oh, me wrong. Yeah. It works, but I mean it, it's not nothing comparable if you run like higher dosages. Yeah. If you do just a higher dosage and just test, it, it will do wonders. Yeah, if you if you do leverage test right and you leverage growth hormone right, it will give you pretty much everything that all the other things are gonna do. Yeah, 100%. You know, yeah, and I think so. It, the most common side effect though with growth hormone in bigger doses, and I know guys that experience this that one unit is is numbing the hands. So, oh yeah, that's true. You know, and it gets it can get bad. So you know that's what I say by what you tolerate. So it generally comes down to what people can deal with with that stuff. Um, and economically yeah. as well, you know, yeah, economically, yeah, yeah. It, because it becomes very expensive. Cool. Well, um, it was great having you on, man. We can keep doing oh, more thank of these. You. Yeah, I'm 100 percent, man. Thank you so much for the invite. Yeah, and I'll put your, I'll link all your stuff down below. All right, awesome. Your Thank Instagram, you so much, everything, Bruce. and you're you're obviously a coach as well, and you're an IFBB pro, and you're moving to the states pretty soon. We'll have you back on stage really soon. Cool. Yeah, hopefully, man. <laughs> we'll do some damage. Yep. Hope so, man. <laughs>